Thank you so much for joining us here today. I am Ashley Johnson, host of the VSO web series DeCapo and the VSO podcast. Before we begin, I have to thank Paul Christensen and RealVest Corporation for sponsoring today's event. Thank you so much, Paul. As well as All Classical Portland, WSU Vancouver, and Chancellor Mel Netzhammer, without whom none of this would have been possible. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Chancellor Mel Netzheimer. Thanks so much, Mel. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, hello, everyone. Virtually, hello, our in person. Welcome to WSU Vancouver. We are so excited to uh, host this event today in what we hope will be, be the beginning of really a long and strong partnership between Vancouver Western Orchestra and WSU Vancouver. Um, for those of you who are joining us virtually who don't know about our campus, uh, Washington State University of Vancouver is part of the larger Washington State University system. We are in the Santa Creek area of Vancouver, Washington on 350 gorgeous acres of land with beautiful mountain views and plenty of trails to, to walk on. So please come, come join us and see, see our land. We have about 3,500 students. So even though we're part of this large system, we are uh, fortunate to have very small classes and uh, a, a very liberal arts college feel to, to our campus. And, and so uh, it's just a wonderful place to be with just a great community and part of a greater community in, in Southwest Washington. So I'm really excited that we're going to start this partnership today. Uh, I want to welcome you all to, to our campus. And I will turn Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Warren Black with All Classical Portland. I took off the mask so you can understand me. I <laughs> the low voice sometimes gets lost in the rumble. But it's always a delight to, uh, to work on things with our partners, our arts partners at the Vancouver Symphony. Uh, in fact, just this Thursday evening, uh, we brought back our Fall into the Arts Radio Festival. And last Thursday's episode of All Classical Portland featured performances held recently by the Vancouver Symphony. So again, it's a delight to work again with our partners and I am honored to be here um, to emcee this panel of distinguished speakers. They're distinguished, I'm not particularly, so pay attention to them. Oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna briefly introduce everybody and then we'll go more in depth with uh, some of these distinguished people here to find out more about uh, working as an artist, um, as a teacher, as an educator, and um, in terms of contests and in terms of the world at large. So the first panelist all the way down at the end there is Zul Bailey, a Grammy Award winning cello virtuoso, entrepreneur, artistic director of several major music festivals throughout the US and a professor of cello at the University of Texas, El Paso, Zul Bailey. On my right, I'm oh, sorry, on my left here, you're right. Uh, Pedro Diaz, an internationally renowned principal solo English horn for the Metropolitan Opera's Orchestra in New York City. He's a recording artist and a music educator. Uh, then down here, Egal Kesselman, Wave to the New York. There I am. Um, an internationally renowned piano educator, director of the Lucy Moses School in New York City, music director of Special Music School, and the artistic director of the Kaufman Music Center International Piano Competition. Finally, Stephen Shepard, PhD, is the VSO's associate concertmaster. He is the Portland Columbia Symphony associate concertmaster, former musician with Westmoreland Wheeling and Cedar Rapids Symphonies, and the Vice Principal of Portland's Roosevelt High School. So that is the panel today. Uh, we'll start with uh, Zool. Give us a little more information, um, I guess, about who you are, and uh, I guess a little bit about the journey that, that got you to where you are today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Uh, I always give advice to students uh, before you get advice from someone, you need to know where they're coming from. You have to know um, kind of their, their take on things to really be able to absorb if it's valid for your own life. 
Uh, so I'll give you a, a little bit of a scoop. Uh, I'll try to make this as short as possible because it, I think it will pay uh, very much forward to the topics we're discussing today. Um, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area in the 1970s. I was born in 1972. Started the cello at four uh, in the, that area because of the Suzuki uh, technique classes that were coming around that area. My sister um, is a violinist. My mom is a pianist, a pedagogue. She went to Peabody Conservatory as well. Um, my father has his doctorate in music education. Uh, so in many ways, I had no choice whether to be in music or not uh, in my household, but that's actually not the case at all. Um, being that there, there are educators and that the area of uh, the Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia region was, um, it provided opportunity. It gave us a vantage point to everything possible, from tennis lessons to soccer teams to art classes to symphonic. Uh, the Kennedy Center was our local concert hall. Our local cellist was Mstislav Rostropovich. Um, everything was really on a, on a red carpet for us, um, but more so it brought my family together because of our common interest in the arts. The arts as a young family um, were what we discussed at the table, the, the dinner table each night. Because of the uh, expression that we were granted through music, um, our conversations were highly um, individualized and interesting. Um, and we didn't, as a family, we, we always said there was, we were four leaders because we all had great opinions because of music and the arts. Um, so with all of those wonderful instructors from my childhood, I just happened to find a passion in music. Uh, music was a part of my life, whether the cello was or not, um, because we would go to these concerts. I began playing in the youth symphonies. I had private lessons. I uh, began taking advantage of every competition uh, in that area, which between my home and, and the Kennedy Center were probably 15 regional orchestras, and that was only 25 miles. So every five or seven miles was another um, heartbeat of that community, which was, which was the symphony uh, orchestra in that area. It brought all of the educators together to be inspired to then go back out in the schools, and the education in the schools musically was also significant because of that. And so I took that for granted as well. Um, but going back to the competitions, each of these, these um, orchestras had a competition. Uh, and those competitions led to opportunity, as well as a, a little bit of spending money if you were lucky enough to, to get a prize in that. Um, at age 12, I realized that um, I couldn't live without music in my life, period. Um, there was no question. Um, I, someone told me once, if you can find what you love to do and make it what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And there was nothing else that I could think about that, uh, other than music that, that brought that, that um, passion. Uh, my parents actually had to ask me to stop practicing as a child uh, and playing my cello. I just loved the feeling of it. Um, and that's another saying that I always tell my students, it's not what you do in life, it's how you make people feel. And music makes people feel. Um, as an undergraduate, I went to Peabody Conservatory and kept building on those competitions and those performance opportunities to begin a very lightweight performing schedule while in school at Peabody. Um, then went to New York City um, and continued my master's degree uh, and continued to build that performing career to when the day I graduated from Juilliard, I was able to pay my basic bills as a performing cellist. Uh, soon after that, about seven years in New York, I moved to El Paso, Texas. Actually, I, I went to visit El Paso, Texas. And um, that was when I was 29, but just really going back just a second, in that decade of leaving the Washington, D.C. area and having those performance opportunities in other communities, I started realizing that this was a very unique community, the D.C. area. Most communities did not invest in their orchestras and did not support the arts and didn't have educational components and didn't have the options of the great teachers that really do define a society. And I began asking in that decade, orchestras and presenting organizations in when I was 19 to 29, how I could go and make a difference in the schools. And it wasn't just the schools, it was the hospitals. It was the, the, the nursing homes, the hospices, the places where those were the patrons when they could be, but now they, are, they were not able to go to the concert hall. So I tried to break music out of the concert hall. In addition to the one concert that I gave 
in any particular period. At that point, I began begging presenters to bring me as a, in residency because a friend gave me some advice. He said, because I, I asked this person who was um, a very famous musician who his favorite, fa most favorite performers in history were, uh, and he said, oh, it's very easy, it's my friends. And I started realizing again, just to put a, 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 a name on a billboard um, and or this or that, just a, and to wonder if people, why they're not coming to concerts, uh, you have to get to know people and connect with people to make it highly personal. So when you tell your story as a performer, they believe you or they're listening. So in 29 years old, I, I was asked to be the artistic director of a series in El Paso, Texas. And all I wished for, for El Paso, was what I grew up with in Washington, D.C. And um, they, they basically asked me to sculpt the cultural landscape of the region, which is about 45 miles long, the city of El Paso, 800,000 people. Um, and all I did was build that connection to human beings through the community that I saw from my childhood, and thus began my career as an artistic director. And I got the same, if not greater, goosebumps um, being a connector of human beings uh, than I did playing a concert. And I realized that this was another path that I, I wanted to take. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, um, yes, I'm a cellist. Um, and I do play the cello, but that's the, the very beginning. That's the thing I'm proud of, but not, it's not the thing that defines me. It's the key that opened the doors to finding me and also making a difference in this world and bringing people together. And that's when we can talk about what my view on the pandemic was mm -hmm. later. But um, the, these, these festivals and bringing communities together through music um, with all of those kind of um, uh, examples growing up, which were the greatest examples. The, I heard the greatest cellist growing up. I, heard, I was at one of the greatest concert halls growing up. There were symphonies everywhere. Um, that I just expect that now. So the bar is set very, very high, and um, I'm thrilled to be here to 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 spin off the questions or to talk about um, what's lacking in society or what kids need now or how to make a sound investment in communities through the orchestras. But uh, thank you for having me today. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's go to Igal next. Uh, tell us a little bit, yeah, about your pathway that brings you to where you are today. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm honored to be here with such distinguished co colleagues and uh, just to hear the fascinating life and career paths of, uh, of my colleagues is, is, is a wonderful thing. So I'm coming from a completely different background, at least at the start point. I was born in Moscow, in Russia, and that's where I lived my first 10 years, and I started my music education at a very special school whose name was actually Special Music School. Um, we, it's uh, a kind of school that I'm actually directing right now where music is a core subject. It's part of the school day regiment and where kids learn music theory, music history. They, they, per, they get their individual lessons during the school day. They perform in concerts and it's absolutely natural to them. They don't know any different because they start in the kindergarten as a class and they continue like that. They don't know that, uh, that they're supposed to be nervous or, or, or there's anything unusual about it. But uh, so that's kind of school that I went for my first three, four years of studies. I am, uh, uh, my parents are not musicians, but they are music lovers. And uh, so they thought piano would be a good instrument because I had a piano at home and I, was really excited about the piano right from the beginning, so that was the instrument for me. Um, I remember at first even composing at the piano, um, then, you know, that went away. I uh, moved to Israel with my family. We immigrated when I was 10 years old, and I continued my music education there. Um, and surprisingly, there was a really, uh, really wonderful, uh, wonderful programs there that were created by important people that actually saw the importance of music education and of music performance, and one of which was Isaac Stern, who uh, sort of founded the Jerusalem Music Center in Jerusalem and created programs for youth. Um, and I sort of witnessed firsthand 
how investment in education pays off because people that uh, the, at that time the kids that were with me on those programs they are concert masters of big orchestras right now they're soloists they are educators they some of them live abroad some of them live in israel and uh um, so it's uh i was able to witness again firsthand how important the encouragement is together with opportunities as a you as a young person to participate in competitions it's the first time that you win something, you get encouraged, you know you're special and you should continue doing what you're doing uh, and practice harder uh, in order to get more opportunities. So those opportunities that are afforded by the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra competition are a kind of opportunities that make or break the life of, uh, life of a young artist. Um, so I stayed in Israel and uh, I studied there for a while. I finished the Rubin Academy of Music at Tel Aviv University, did my military service as all Israelis do, and, uh, and went to pursue some graduate work at uh, Peabody Conservatory, um, which where I did my master's and my, my doctorate, and uh, which was the Baltimore was the, first per was the first place I've seen in the United States, the first place I auditioned at. And, uh, and the, the first place I got to live in the US um, and meet a lot of wonderful people, uh, with many of whom I'm still in touch, um, to play with different musicians and sort of started developing my career as a performer, doing the grown-up competitions, performing some concerts um, in the US and, and, and abroad. And uh, in the late 90s, I moved to New York City, as many of my fellow musicians did because that was the place to be. Um, and uh, at that point, you know, I was still playing and teaching, started teaching a little bit and found uh, interest in administration, in helping. Um, I started volunteering and then working part-time uh, first at America Israel Culture Foundation, then in other places. And uh, I saw, wow, I can, I can not only be on stage, but I can also help behind the scenes. I can, uh, I can make sure things happen the way I envision them to happen, or I can at least support that in this way or another. And so I found some excitement about that, and uh, uh, even to the point where I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to embark on a career of an administrator, I probably should get some more tools. And so I went, do, did some more schooling, got an MBA uh, in New York City, and uh, which was a, also a fascinating experience for me because I get to go to school with people that knew nothing about music. And, uh, you know, uh, things, uh, uh, things were different for them. So, but it was, it was a wonderful experience. It definitely gave me some tools to, uh, you know, to do things uh, that I'm doing right now. And, uh, and then I left for Chicago for a little bit of time, running a music foundation there. Their opportunity opened up at, at Kaufman Music Center, which is my musical home now. It's a home for American Concert Hall, which is one of the best concert hall of mid-size in New York City. Lucy Moses School, which is a community art school in Manhattan with music, dance, and theater programs, very large school. Uh, special Music School, that's the kind of school I started at, which is public-private partnership between Kaufman Music Center and the uh, Department of Education in New York City, where again kids get all this great music education for, uh, for a price of nothing, because it's a public school. And Kaufman Music Center raises over $3 million every year to support those programs, because we believe it's important and because, you know, we don't differentiate haves from have-nots. And uh, so every kid that is musically talented does have an opportunity to audition or to do assessment and come to our school and be part of our programs. Um, and uh, again, to encourage young people, uh, somewhere around 20, I believe 2013, I founded the Kaufman Music Center International Youth Piano Competition, which happens every two years um, and uh, at, at Merkin Concert Hall in New York City. And we have, uh, we have kids that come from all over the United States, from Canada, from, from Europe, from the Far East, and uh, they perform uninterrupted on an important stage, which is a wonderful sort of experience for them. Um, and um, yeah, so that's sort of the path my life took me. I, I never planned it to, be, to, to work out like that, but that's, I guess, one of the most fascinating things to watch with my colleagues and myself is 
you know, you start loving music, practicing, and, 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 and at the end, uh, you know, your career takes you wherever it takes you. But uh, as Zul mentioned, you know, it's all, it's a key to a door that opens a whole world of opportunities for impact, uh, for, to pursue, for access and excellence for lots of young people as well as older audiences. Thank you. Stephen, let's hear from you. Wow, this is a great opportunity for me. I'd like to thank Igor for inviting me to uh, be part of this uh, panel. I'd like to thank the other panelists for coming to uh, Vancouver, Washington to uh, participate in this. This is the first time that I've been able to, to participate in something like this, and so I'm really fortunate to have that opportunity. And uh, this is something that I think needs to happen, not only here in Vancouver, but throughout the country, particularly now that we're coming back from uh, the age of COVID and our arts organizations are getting their feet back underneath them and moving forward. I'd also like to thank the uh, Chancellor and Washington State University of Vancouver for providing us this opportunity here with this lovely venue. And uh, Mr. Christensen for uh, uh, making all this happen as well. I mean, it's really a blessing to be part of this. And uh, I'll go ahead and start. I'm Steve Shepard. I was born in 1970 in Kansas City, Missouri. In 1976, I believe that was the summer before my first grade year, my mother, who was a music educator uh, before she ascended the ladder and eventually became assistant superintendent with the KCMO Public Schools, uh, came home and asked me flat out, do you want to play the violin? I was six years old, so I was sure, yeah, I'll do whatever. And so uh, she had found the Suzuki Method, like Azul had said, in Kansas City. And I went ahead and started with an individual and uh, changed from that teacher to another teacher that was uh, uh, more certified in Suzuki and was in residence at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And so that's where my true Suzuki experience started. And uh, it was a great experience for me. We were always uh, told that we had to memorize the songs and perform them at the group class before we could move on to the next song. And when I say group class, I'm talking every Saturday. I miss those Saturday morning cartoons. Thank goodness for the Cartoon Channel. I was able to make those up once I got to college. But uh, I played the youth orchestra scene. I played the uh, all state scene in Missouri. Uh, some of the common interests that our family had that we talked about at the dinner table were music, uh, education in general, and sports. And so I was an avid fan of football. I still am. And I tried my hat at football for a couple of years. Uh, I stopped as a freshman in high school after that season when I got what they called back then my bell rung a few times. Now they refer to those as actual concussions. And so I had to make a decision by the time that I I uh, uh, got to my sophomore year, I had heard from every public university in the state of Missouri about uh, coming to college there. And uh, none of the football programs were ca calling. So I had to decide that, you know, I'm really not that big. I got my bell rung. It doesn't feel great. And so that's when I decided I was going to uh, pursue music. I always knew that I wanted to perform, even from an early age, around six or seven. But to be given an opportunity as a sophomore in high school and knowing that these institutions were uh, calling for me and wanting me and, and that they had noticed me in these uh, state competitions that uh, public schools generally uh, participate in throughout the country. It was an eye-opener. And so I did not stay in Missouri. My mom's goal for me and my brother was always to get us out of the environment that we were comfortable in. And she wanted us to fly away from the nest, so to speak. And something else that she always told us is she wanted us to develop a sellable skill, is what she called it. And I went to the University of Iowa. Both of my parents were graduates of the University of Iowa. That's where they met. My brother had uh, uh, gone to the University of Iowa. He was three years older than me. So I had some connections once I got to the university. Um, I got a bachelor's of music degree in 1993. And uh, one of my former teachers in Kansas City, Charles Stegman, who was an uh, uh, associate concert master with the Kansas City Symphony when I studied with him in high school, he had moved on to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I got a call from him when I was a senior. Hey, we've got a spot for you if you want to come out and audition. And so I uh, hopped on a plane, went out, and uh, reconnected with him. Was fortunate to have uh, been, been given a scholarship to attend Duquesne, where I got my master's degree and uh, uh, my artist diploma. And what was unique about Duquesne at the time is one of the only uh, universities out there that had an orchestra lit and repertoire program, where we were actually uh, uh, graded on the development and uh, a mastery of, say, 30 or 40 excerpts that are commonly used on auditions. And we would have mock auditions 
and it was a, a great situation because we had members of the Pittsburgh Symphony, members of the Pittsburgh Opera and the ballet that were serving as committee members on these mock auditions. Any audition that happened within proximity of the school that you could drive to, you were expected to attend if you were invited. And so that gave us an opportunity to be pushed out of the nest at Duquesne to go out and explore things. And so these are valuable experiences that I felt I had because of where I went and uh, would not have gotten them had I gone to uh, other schools. And so after I graduated with the artist diploma, I believe it was 1997, I decided I was gonna get uh, my doctorate. And I need to clarify, I have a doctorate of musical arts. It's a DMA, I do not hold a PhD. However, my better half up in Longview, who's hopefully listening right now, Lynette Shepard, does have a PhD in music education. So we met when we were both doing our doctorates back at Iowa in Iowa City, and I was there from 1997 to 2003 doing mine, and I met her in 1998. Uh, in 1999, we were, we were married, and uh, we were still doing our schooling, but I was at the same time to the point where I developed my skills. I was a certified Suzuki teacher, and I was teaching and playing uh, uh, with the Cedar Rapids Symphony. I played with the Des Moines Symphony, the Quad City Symphony in Davenport, had hired me a few times. And so I was actually making a living as a full-time student because of the craft that I developed back when I was six years old. And I felt good about that. The money was good. I was making a living. And uh, then my wife said, after we were finished with our uh, doctorates, if we stay here, we'll always be considered students. We need to fly away and make a leap, either the West Coast or the East Coast. And so she found a job as an orchestra teacher in Salem-Kaiser, down the road in Salem. We went ahead and moved everything out here. We've been here ever since. I met my uh, uh, first opportunity with the Vancouver Symphony in McMinnville, Oregon, in fact. We were uh, playing a gig. I had been hired to uh, be an adjunct professor at Linfield College. And with that role, I was concertmaster of the Linfield Chamber Orchestra, which is now defunct. But I met a, a lovely lady. Her name at the time was Kirsten Hisatomi. She's now Kirsten Noble, as she has been uh, uh, married since then. We developed a relationship. She asked me to uh, come up and sit in with the Vancouver Symphony a few times. And after those few times, I drove home and told my wife, hey, this is a great orchestra. The musicians are great. They seem to enjoy each other. Everyone gets along. I really, really want to be a part of this. And so uh, they kept asking me to come back, and I've been playing with them ever since. It's uh, been, what, 17 years, 2004 to now. And so uh, I hope my math's right, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But uh, great experience, great organization, a strong organization. Uh, we'll talk more about the organization and our stability throughout the pandemic when we get to that section in the uh, program here. A lot of uh, uh, instrumentalists freelance for a living, and that's what I was doing for the longest time. And like I said, the money was good. I was uh, uh, younger, it felt good. Uh, then we started having kids, and it got to the point where my oldest daughter was three, and she asked me why I was always gone at night. And so at that point, uh, I figured that this is the time for me to go back and get a teaching certificate so I could participate in teaching in the public schools. I thought it would be as easy as just going back and getting that fifth year of study that you need when I had gone through college because that's what the requirement was then. But unfortunately, everyone was talking about a master's degree in teaching and things had changed. And so uh, I'm like, well, I have a terminal degree already. What am I going to do? Fortunately, I was able to find a program right up the road in Lacey, Washington at St. Martin's University. Alternate route to teacher certification is what it was called. And it was an accelerated program. We met one summer from uh, 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. After uh, uh, the summer ended, they uh, uh, had me assigned to a classroom in Longview where I live with uh, two mentor teachers. So I was a student teacher. I did that stint from September to January, did a few seminar classes in that spring of the following year, and I was done. I had my teaching certificate. I was able to go out and apply for positions where I would have the ability to still play at night, still teach after school, but I wouldn't necessarily have to answer the phone and say yes every time it rang, because I knew I was going to have that steady income coming in now from being a public school teacher. So I found my first job was in, with the Kelso School District up in Kelso, Washington. I was a general music teacher uh, and uh, orchestra teacher. After that year, uh, I'm sure all of us remember the year of 2008 where the floor fell out from underneath everyone and 
the budget cuts happened. And so I was rift. That's a reduction in force is what that acronym means. And so I had to find another job. And fortunately, I did. It took a little while, several weeks, but I found a job in Lacey, Washington, 90 minutes away each way, right? And so I did that job for two years. That's the only thing that was as close into Longview as I could find in Washington. And so I was happy to do it. I was still employed. I was uh, 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 driving a cool car, had a satellite radio now because of all the time I was putting on the road and uh, didn't fall asleep. That was my biggest fear, not going up to work, but coming back home was where, what it was I going to fall asleep on the way home. So that's when I started uh, being a coffee connoisseur. And so uh, drank a lot of coffee, made that trip back and forth, uh, still played at night, still taught lessons after school. For a while, I was driving from Lacey all the way down to Salem because I still had a studio there and uh, uh, phased that out eventually. But uh, the most important thing is my daughter was finally happy because I was home more. And uh, that was my priority. But I wanted to make sure that I was still going to be able to provide, uh, contribute to the uh, family income. And so it really worked out for me that I was able to get that teaching certificate uh, from there, I, uh, I worked two years in Lacey, and then uh, there was a position that opened up in Longview as an orchestra teacher and general music teacher, and band teacher, for that matter. Let's go, we'll get to that in a minute. That's, that's an interesting story. So I taught in uh, a middle school in Longview for five years, and after the third year, uh, it got to the point where it was after spring break. We came back from spring break. I remember vividly a couple weeks after that, I started leaving the school every day with my ears ringing. And my wife told me that uh, if you're thinking about administration, now's the time because that is hearing loss that you're experiencing. It's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse if you keep dealing with it. And so it wasn't the orchestra piece that was uh, causing the hearing loss. It was the, uh, the band. And uh, uh, in particular, the saxophones, I think, that were right in front of me. <laughs> and as beginners trying to develop their craft. And uh, uh, they got to the point where they sounded great, but the, the decibel level was just too much for my ears to handle. And so I thought about it, and I was going to wait another year and see how I fared. So the summer came and went. Went back in the fall, and the same thing started happening, only this time it happened around Halloween. And so it convinced me that it was time to maybe look at administration. And so I found an administrative program down in Portland at uh, University of Portland. It was a one-year program. We met every Wednesday night from uh, 4.30 to 10. And uh, uh, did the internship, uh, knocked that out, got my uh, certificate, and uh, started applying for jobs. And uh, within a year, I was actually hired, ironically enough, at the middle school where I had been teaching. And so it was a smooth transition for me. I uh, uh, knew the families for the most part. I knew most of the students because I was teaching six, seven, and eight, you know, and so most of them were coming through my class or if they weren't coming through my classes, they were going through the choir class, which was right next door. I knew the staff, I knew uh, 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 the teachers, and so it was a great situation. Uh, after two years of that, I started thinking that I may want to uh, explore a larger school district with more diversity. And so there's not much diversity up in Longview. And I started to contemplate whether or not I was going to uh, make that move. And my fear was the longer I stayed with a smaller school district, the harder it would be for me to break into a larger one. So just this last summer, I uh, uh, rolled the dice and started applying to larger school districts as far as uh, uh, Tacoma up north and as far down as uh, Vancouver and Portland in uh, the south. And so um, PPS, Portland Public Schools, has hired me as a vice principal at Roosevelt High School. It's a great situation. I love the gig so far. Uh, the district is uh, 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 one of the largest in the region, if not the largest in the region. And so I'm in a good place. The, the administrative team is fabulous. I feel like I'm fitting in and uh, we are getting things done. And so I feel wonderful, wonderfully humbled to be a part of that moving forward. And it's not something that I take lightly. Uh, I'm developing relationships with uh, many of the students. Uh, it's a challenge, however, because we are at 14, 50, maybe 1470 in regard to students, whereas in Longview we only had 430 in the building. And so uh, the staff's bigger. I'm learning names. I'm learning the routines. I'm learning the systems of the school district. And I think it's going to be a good fit moving forward. Uh, 
my daughters are now 20 and 14, and so I'm to the point where I can actually start answering that phone a little bit more if I want to and accepting more gigs. And if uh, most of the gigs are down in the Portland area to begin with, I'm already there. So it's, it's a win-win, I think, for me in that uh, I'm able to uh, continue to perform. I'm able to continue performing on my own terms. I don't necessarily have to say yes to everything. And uh, I'm still playing with uh, this wonderful orchestra, the Vancouver Symphony. And so I feel great right now. And again, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this experience. And we'll talk more about uh, the pandemic, the importance of music education in the schools, how it impacts students and uh, families. And uh, I'll just turn it back over. All right, thank you. Thank you again for having me. All right, and Pedro, let's hear about you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wow. <coughs> wow, what remarkable stories my colleagues have to say. I'm, I'm honored to be with them, and uh, I'm honored to be in beautiful Vancouver, Washington. Thank you so much for the invitation. Ah, oh, what should I say after all of this? It's <laughs> wonderful. You were fascinated. Yes, we'll get to that, I guess. Uh, yes, it's incredible that I'm here with some uh, colleagues who I've just met, others are neighbors, and others I've known for a long time. I've had the fortune of knowing Stephen for a while, and coincidentally. And so, what's my story? Let's see. Well, I was born in Puerto Rico, and when I was three years old, my father, who actually is his birthday today, he would have been 93 today, uh, he was a novelist and a writer, and my mother was a physical therapist, and my father was in Spain because he was in a literary congress, in 1968, and he fell in love with the city of Madrid, and he said to my mother, you're a physical therapist, you can work whatever you want in the world. You know, they always need physical therapists and nurses. So can we please move to Spain just for a while? I want to write a novel there. And so in the end, he wrote the, the novel that put him on a map as a, as, a, as a writer. But my brother and I, my brother is two years older than me, and I was three years old, we went to Spain, uh, I went to school. And my father was of a town in Puerto Rico where he, in his family they listened to opera every Sunday. It was a, you know, opera loving family. I still have my f grandfather's records that I inherited from the Metropolitan Opera Company uh, Record Club. And so at home we would listen to uh, Stravinsky and Prokofiev. It wasn't you know, your typical Mozart Beethoven family. He liked to listen to uh, avant-garde music and, and also Debussy. And of course, Tito Rodriguez and Perez Prado and all those things too. Of course, you have to be able to mishmash. And my brother, when he was about seven years old, he got to study at the, at the conservatory in Madrid. He went in to study piano. But in those days, it was a very old French system where you had to study solfege for a whole year before you could even touch a piano. So I think right at the end of it, he just basically gave up. <laughs> he decided he didn't want to go into music then. And, but we went to concerts every Sunday. We heard the orchestra play. And uh, so we were very familiarized with an orchestra, with symphonic concerts, with all kinds of um, composers, not just uh, the, the well-known ones. And. Uh, my father had a very interesting stereo. He had a, he had a thing that played the records and he, he put the, the arm on, over the record and he had a little needle, which I, unfortunately I got to break a couple of times and would be reprimanded for. But I begged him to let me use it, to let me put the records on myself. So I wanted to hear that music over and over. And so when I was in fourth grade, we went back to Puerto Rico um, for some family uh, issues and um, my brother, again, had a chance to study music again, so he went to a, a school called, called the Escuela Libre de Musica, and it's a special music school, just like the ones we, my colleagues have spoken about. In Puerto Rico, it was instituted in 1937 by a politician named Ernesto Ramos Antonini. And this school, like every other school that we have uh, heard about, uh, you get to study in a public school that teaches half a day music and then half a day academics. My brother decided to take the French horn, and so you started in seventh grade, and so two years later, I had a chance to audition for the school, and then they asked me, what do you want to play? And I said, I want to play the oboe. 
And my brother said, don't play the oboe. It's, it's a terrible idea. You know, it's, it's very delicate instruments, the reeds and the kicks, they break and all that. And it's like, sounds like a great challenge. I want to play the oboe. <laughs> and so um, a few years later, I, you know, I, I worked really hard on trying to get to play the oboe, which I'm still doing. And we went to concerts. Our parents took us to concerts. And then I got to join the youth orchestra. And when I was, I think I want to say, was 17 years old, we had the most uncommon visit from a man in Pittsburgh whose name is Robert Boudreau. And many of us would know this name because he was the leader and the conductor of the American Wind Symphony. And this was an orchestra, a wind orchestra that traveled on a barge. Uh, this barge was actually designed by a famous artist. I can't remember now his name. Maybe you can, you can help me. And <laughs> they traveled through the rivers in the United States, and they gave concerts. And they played all kinds of contemporary music, uh, also very good arrangements of Sousa music. And he managed to bring this barge into the Caribbean, believe it or not. And they ended up in San Juan, Puerto Rico. They brought some composers like David Amran, and they played a lot of contemporary music. And so he went to our school, and he auditioned some of the students to have some special grant programs to study in Pittsburgh. So when I was 17, I got to come to Pittsburgh for the first time uh, to study music with uh, Mr. Gordon from the Pittsburgh Symphony. And so this was a, a first step into uh, what became then the inevitable career. And then a few years later, I auditioned for uh, the Juilliard School. And actually, I auditioned to the Juilliard School with a plastic oboe, because we had limited means in my family. And so this, this just proves that if you really want to be a musician, all you have to do is just, just do it. You, know, you don't have to have the means, not always. And so after that, I basically did a few things here and there, freelance a little bit. And then my first orchestra job was in South Africa. I got to play in the Natal Philharmonic. And a few years later, I ended up in Mexico City. And so I've become a citizen of the world. Um, and all the time I went back to Pittsburgh again, where I met Steven and Igor. We met there, we played together. And so bouncing around here and there, ended up in New York again, where I performed in some of the orchestras there. And then I got to audition for the uh, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. This was supposed to be my last audition, actually. I thought, well, I'm getting up, you know, up there, and I, I'm not so happy about freelancing anymore. So I'm going to take this audition. If for some reason it doesn't happen, maybe, maybe I look at another career option. And so I got lucky, and I also put a deadline on myself. So sometimes that's all you have to do also to, to make it through this. And uh, I've been doing it for 16 years. I'm married to a wonderful violinist also, but she's not a violinist anymore. She is a wonderful violinist, but she has actually a, a normal job, like we say. <laughs> and um, a daughter, she's 12 years old, and she plays the cello. And so um, that's all I have to say right now. All right. Thank you. Well, it's good to hear more about everybody. So you are all here to participate in the Young Artist Competition, to judge Young, competi young Artist Competition tomorrow. Uh, what's interesting about that is that the last time around it was a largely virtual event because of this pandemic thing that's pretty much the elephant in the room in every discussion about the arts and pretty much everything these days. So. I'd, I think that seems like a, a good place to turn to. Uh, let's like to hear from you. Uh, well, I'd like to hear from all of you. We'll start with Zul about uh, ways that you've uh, creative ways that you've found to deal with the situation in the last what is it, sixteen, seventeen months. We're talking about the pandemic, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, had you asked me two months ago, I would have a different answer. So I'm going to be very careful with it because it's changing so much. I think <clears throat> that this, it's kind of like the stages of grief, um, of healing. We were all in shock at first. Um, I had never not traveled, uh, so I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what home meant truly because I'd, I'd been traveling since I was 17. So being home for more than a week or four days was beyond me. Um, I I realized 
in the first stage of this um, being home and the chaos of life, how much noise was in the world. Uh, and just sitting in silence was very um, deafening, but also purifying and cleansing. Um, and I, I started getting angry at things like social media and the things that were, that were not real. And I started realizing that the people that you're with are real <clears throat> and you're in, in relationships, investing in relationships that are actually tangible are what sh it should be. I started kind of rewiring and uh, this, we're now into a couple of months in um, and started to revisit why I play the cello, why music, um, the mission of just, you know, I, I always tell my students the re repetition only makes the unacceptable familiar. Um, <laughs> so you do something over and over, that's because it's the, how you do it. It doesn't mean it's right, it's just how you do it. And also practice makes permanent. Um, so the first four months were really, really interesting for me. I was uh, working with my organizations, including the Northwest Bach Fest here in your state of, of Washington in Spokane, um, to create uh, a virtual, ever, the, the, the idea of virtual, virtual um, presentations was always there, um, but it was never really needed. Um, I think one of the, the, the first organizations in the world that really did self-invest was the Berlin Philharmonic, where they began documenting and really making a, a, a catalog of, of these um, <clears throat> films and documenting it for people that could not come to the concerts. Um, so the silver lining of this, which I'm jumping forward a little bit, is that we had to catch up um, to bring the electronic media that is so powerful in this world, television, film, the internet, social media, and make it personal. So the thing that made me disgusted about it, which is this facade of, of what that everyone wants to be seen as versus what they are, um, it had to become reality. And so we in the organizations that I'm with were trying to figure out how to bring people together in ways that we'd never dreamed we would have to. Uh, that's through teaching, of course. People had done the, the Skype teaching before, the Zoom teaching before, the other teaching. But um, we had to invent a season. We had to invent a presence uh, to bring people together. In my particular case, I enjoy community engagement a lot. I, enjoy, I love going to schools and playing for kids. I love pl going, to, as I said, going to hospitals. But the amount of work that one like myself does um, for a few hundred people, you can't buy face to face. But with virtual, I did um, up to 8,000 kids in one presentation versus 300, 300, 400. And so I started realizing the massive impact that one could have and I could see them. Now it's not the same, but you could have both. So I started kind of seeing, and then I read this wonderful article about, that, that woke me um, up to seeing how to move forward. And it was, it was uh, an article about pandemics and kind of trauma. And you see them have, uh, kind of as a portal. And to properly move to a new chapter where there are a completely different set of rules. The, the best thing you can do is bring as few of the things you know through. You can't say, well, I used to do and I had done and this, you have to actually reinvent. So I literally in August, October of, of, of 20, I've lost complete track of the calendar. Um, <laughs> I began trying not to think the same. And I began thinking about how with this new set of rules, can we reinvent? which is very liberating. So the, the, the hope started for me as a presenter, as a performer, as an educator, um, as, uh, just as, as, as a friend, as a father. I, I'll just go on, on record to say that I, I was gone for most of my two children's childhoods. And I was lucky enough to have, because of the pandemic, the last year and a half of my son's life together before he went to college. I never thought that that was going to be such a gift. I didn't realize how important it was because we both, that's all we knew. So I knew now, I know what I was missing. Now that's never going to happen again. So um, it's been a huge cycle for me 
of, of um, what I won't do again, mm. how to say no, what home means, what friendships mean, how we can move forward in positive ways by holding hands, because holding hands is a connection that we lost for a year. We could not hold hands with our friends. We could not embrace. We could not see our friends. And now we have this wonderful um, treasure trove of tools that we can use to bring a greater impact to our communities, but they can't replace face-to-face -face interaction and live concerts. Yeah. So um, I know that you're all, you all have intimate connections with education and with students in particular. So I'm curious to know um, how you've seen the pandemic affecting the work of the institutions that you're part of. Um, you go. Well, I remember on, uh, on March 5th or 6th, 2020, I was judging a competition in San Antonio. And uh, I remember coming back and a week later, with probably within a couple of days notice, things were getting significantly worse in New York City. And on the 13th of uh, March, we closed the school. We closed the entire Kaufman Music Center and we moved 150 teachers, music teachers, online um, within, just within a couple of days. I remember buying phones, doing door-to-door uh, -door tech support for faculty that never used the computer before. <laughs> and uh, so th that, that was quite, uh, it was very abrupt. It, in, it was quite amazing how quickly we were able to, to move and to embrace a new reality of teaching online. And just a few weeks later, we started um, presenting online. We started doing first uh, student performances uh, over Zoom and other means digitally. Uh, we started to produce professional concerts. Um, we, as Kaufman Music Center, which again, the, the, um, the place where I work, we um, started a sort of, now became a uh, fairly famous venture called Musica Store Storefronts, where uh, we partnered with Alpha Dine Foundation and were able to employ over 200 musicians performing over 100 concerts behind glass of, of a music of a store, uh, of course, a digitally enhanced sound. Um, and about 30,000 people, passers by, were walking on Broadway and, and looking and seeing. Uh, and hearing music and live mu live music that they haven't had a chance to see to hear in months, um, we were able to again pivot and present over 60 student concerts online. Um, but we also felt that the human element is absolutely crucial and important. And so, somewhere around October, September, October of 2020, we opened the school. Um, safely to limited capacity of students with a lot of precautions. And we opened uh, chamber music, um, some group, group instruction, private lessons remained uh, online for, for, for some time still. And, um, but we were able to produce uh, concerts, live concerts, again safely with distancing and masks at Merkin Hall, which is a large concert, uh, concert hall for, to have 20 people in. Um, and so the, the students were able to, uh, those that wanted to do a comfortable performing in person, were able to uh, come in and actually perform live on stage in front of the audience. And I really take my hat off to our visionary executive director, Kate Sheeran, and our terrific board that, and staff that, uh, that was so instrumental in making it happen because many other organizations didn't survive the pandemic but uh, we were able to raise money and to continue our programs and to, um, and to, to thrive. And as Zul said, you know, coming out of the pandemic now, it's, uh, we're sort of reevaluating. Um, everybody does. We see our families, our, our performers are evaluating. Um, I run a concert series at American Holocaust Tuesday Matinee Series, which sort of presents young, exciting artists from all over the world, usually in their 20s. And um, you know, it's every everybody is everything is a little bit different, 
um, and everybody's reevaluating their priorities, so it's, it's, it's an opportunity uh, to, uh, to create for us a better musical world, so to speak, to connect with our audiences in many different ways, both online and, uh, and in person. And I remember that uh, producing those digital presentations was especially important for the series that I run because it's, uh, uh, it has a large contingent of retired professionals and they were sort of the weakest population during the COVID times and they really appreciated being able to be together even so digitally with, uh, with artists and other audience members to take part and listen to some great music. Mm, thank you. Uh, Stephen, what changes are you seeing in terms of like curriculum or ways that you're teaching students as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, as an administrator, we were watching the whole thing unfold very, very closely. We knew that uh, after what happened up in New York, there were some cases out here in the Seattle area uh, that there were going to be some changes coming. We just didn't know when. With regard to the music programs, I knew that there was going to be a, a hit when the story came out. I think it was Mount Vernon, Washington. There was a choir rehearsal at a church. And uh, a number of individuals contracted the virus and uh, subsequently died from it. At that point, I knew that the music programs were going to take a hit, at least in Washington and perhaps throughout the country. We started hearing this word that everyone can repeat, aerosols. Right? The aerosols emitted from the wind and brass instruments that were instrumental in uh, passing on the virus, particularly in smaller classrooms that weren't well ventilated. Uh, coincidentally enough, though, we did not hear any rumblings about the string music programs because you can play these instruments while wearing a mask. And so at that point, I felt comfortable in knowing that um, we were going to be able to move on as a performance entity, the string piece at least. It did make me feel sick to my gut that my friends and colleagues that were wind players and brass players were not going to be in the same position. And so it was uh, the middle of March, I think, like a lot of other places that the schools shut down and we transitioned to remote learning. And the curriculum stayed the same for the most part through that first spring. We made adjustments through the summer to ensure that we had our act together a little bit more in regard to remote learning and then started again in the fall. What we found out though is remote learning worked well with some kids, but for some other kids, it did not work well at all. We had a number of children that were unengaged. They wouldn't turn their cameras on and the, the teachers were frustrated. The teachers were still trying to teach. The teachers had made their adjustments and were being flexible. We're offering a, 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 essentially virtual classes and we weren't getting the results that we wanted to get with the curriculums that we were using. And so what you're seeing are gaps in learning moving forward. And you've got some students that were really dialed in. Fortunately, my daughters were two of them. And you've got some students that just weren't dialed in. They were out you know, running around with their friends when they should have been in school. And so there's always been a gap and there's always been a challenge to close that gap. But it became more pronounced during this pandemic. And some districts have two, three year plans to incorporate uh, extended years uh, summer school opportunities to try to bridge these gaps. The, the, the biggest problem as a parent is whether or not your child is going to be held back in, with regard to their education while the others are trying to catch up because everyone moved forward to grade level, whether they were ready to or not. And so that's something that we've had to tiptoe around with, uh, per, uh, particularly in my first few weeks on the job with uh, Portland Public Schools. We're trying to identify where these gaps are. We're trying to identify the students that need uh, more supports and making sure that they get those supports. But the engagement piece is so important. So we've been working hard with families, trying to uh, build those relationships, trying to uh, get them to trust us in regard to uh, getting the kids vaccinated so we don't have to you know, deal with quarantines anymore because if they're not at school, they're not gaining the access to the education. They're not gain, gaining access to the instruction. And you need the instruction to learn. And you're not going to move forward if you don't learn. So curriculums 
have, for the most part, stayed the same. You are going to see a change in uh, how we deliver these curriculums, though, because as I said, some of these families really worked well online, and these are families that really didn't work well in the setting when we were full open in-person learning. So we've got virtual academies popping up here and there that are affiliated with the school districts. I know that ours has a 700 person waiting list right now because of the demand. And so our school district's working hard to uh, get that in place. There are other school districts that are also working hard to get that in place. And hopefully we'll be able to move forward. We don't want to lose those students. We want those students to graduate as Portland Public School students. And so we're going to do our best to make sure all those accommodations are met. But it will be a challenge moving forward. There are going to be some changes in how education is uh, presented, and how it's viewed, how it's valued. And uh, I hope that everyone is on the same page at the end of the day because it's important education like my mom would always say it's the only thing that no one can ever take from you they can take a lot from you but they won't be able to take your education but we got to get the kids in class and we got to get the kids engaged and we got to get the parents to uh, encourage their kids to be engaged and so that's the biggest issue that i see right now uh the music programs are going to be coming back uh, i think that many administrations and districts are sensitive to the fact that we need to uh, do a bit of rebuilding. Learning these instruments online is tough. It's really tough when you don't have that face-to-face, -face, uh, particularly with beginners. And so that's where we saw our biggest hit was with, with, with the beginners. I mean, they, they, they lost interest and they decided they were gonna choose another elective. And that's no fault of the music teacher. That's no fault of the music program. That's just the circumstance that we were in. And so we're working hard to maybe get some of those students back into the program and give us another chance. We're working hard to ensure that the incoming students know that they're gonna get, and the parents of the incoming students know that it's going to be worthwhile. We're gonna teach those life skills that a lot of other students don't get because they don't participate in the arts programs. And uh, we're just gonna move forward. But there will be some rebuilding that will have to be done in certain regions of the country. Yes. Uh, Pedro, as a member of a, the, the, Met, um, the Met Opera Orchestra, what have you seen, what effects have you seen from the pandemic on those kinds of organizations? Well, our organization, without getting too much into politics, had a, an exception, an exceptional situation. But um, we, we had a, a difficulty agreeing with the management on how they were going to proceed and didn't turn out so well, but uh, let's just say that most orchestras end up, ended up getting paid through the pandemic at a special situation where the uh, donors were able to come together in favor of the musicians. That was not the case for us, unfortunately, but uh, that's water under the bridge. Now we have a new negotiation and it's working okay. We're back to work and happy to, but uh, in my personal case, well, when this happened, of course, I had more time to make reads, which was always great. <laughs> but uh, there was a big vacuum. I, I am not teaching anymore. I used to teach at Juilliard, and I used to teach at Stony Brook, uh, New York State University. But for the reasons that Stephen mentioned, I wanted to spend more time with my family. So uh, I have big ties to Latin America. I have students in, uh, in Mexico, Panama, Venezuela. And so I started to teach um, pro bono every day online to some of the students that I know and their teachers we did uh, master classes but I also in the United States started teaching for twenty dollars a half an hour to anybody who wanted to take lessons with me and that included you know some semi-professionals amateurs younger students so this was uh, a way for me to you know find my audience again but you remember how I said uh, that small comment about my father's turntable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It turns out that my father and I always shared that uh, passion, and he also had friends who were back in Puerto Rico. They were writers and painters, and some of them were audiophiles. You know, they, they listened to music, mm -hmm. and they built equipment, and they were record collectors. And so I know some people in the audio business, and I, I know some composers who were also uh, somehow intertwined in a very strange ways into the audio business. And so I decided, actually I'd done it about a month before the pandemic, I started a channel on YouTube, a YouTube channel with the, pur with the purpose of bridging the gap between audiophiles and musicians. Because I noticed that a lot of audiophiles would not leave the cave 
to go to concerts. And I figured this is a way that we can bring people to the Met, bring people to concerts. So I started this YouTube channel and I had the unique chance of putting some conductors against the wall and some singers. So I managed to interview Sir Simon Rattle, uh, <coughs> Joyce Donato, uh, I interviewed the oboe players in the Berlin Philharmonic, um, some other people in the business, also some people in the audio business. And now as the pandemic progressed, it was more difficult for me to do this. So I started doing headphone reviews and you know, talk about recordings. But I started to have a, a daily, uh, a Sunday live show where my uh, viewers, which are more mostly in Spain, Argentina, Mexico, and Chile, we would get together and for an hour and a half, and then I would speak about music, and I would speak about uh, Beethoven, Berlioz, uh, what does a conductor do? Uh, why do we have movements in a symphony? Uh, how Haydn invented the symphony and the movements? What are the movements for? And uh, who invented the piano sonata? And so it became very popular, and at the end of a few months, my viewers started to say, Pedro, because of you, I started to listen to classical music again. And for me, that was just very, very uh, refreshing and satisfying because I found a new audience. It was a way to have an audience, which I, I still do. You know, I still have these uh, chats on with, with my viewers once in a while live. And it has become a, a passion for them, but for me too, to, to find a way to, to en enlighten these people and engage them in a way that they never thought possible because a lot of record collectors and audiophiles, they want to listen to classical music. They want, they want to come to symphonic concerts. They want to listen to opera, but they don't know where to begin. Sometimes it's just a matter of saying, you know, have you ever heard The Rite of Spring? You know, uh, do you like rock? Well, then you should listen to Bruckner. You know, it, it all comes from there, you know. Uh, and so it's been something that I've been doing. Of course, I've also given some master classes and I have lessons, and I have also done those little concerts where everybody looks like the Partridge family. Yeah. You know, I've, I've done some of those too. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured it was time for me to, uh, you know, to be in touch with my, my other, my hobby, and those people who are involved in it. And I think it's turned out to be an interesting project. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've always, always very impressed, I've been very impressed over the last year and a half of, of the creativity of of the side hustles that people have come up with, the new skills that people have added to what they already learned. So, um, love to talk about that a little bit more. I just wanted to check in with Ashley and with Igor. Do we have questions from anyone here, or were there questions submitted from the people online? Any questions here? For oh, yes. Oh. So we can hear you. So yeah, we'll take a few questions here, but. Okay, I'll uh, start with you, Jay. Soon eager. First, I want to thank you all for being here. This is really great, and I agree we should do more of this. And thank you for coming to Vancouver and recognizing what a remarkable organization our orchestra is. And I am so proud that of the way the staff and the donors and the board, everyone has uh, pursued this and just not taken no for an answer and um, uh, made it work, made it work all the way through, kept it afloat. That was Igor's uh, stated uh, goal at the beginning and it certainly has happened and it shows what a strong community we have for the orchestra which is what uh, our conductor Salvador Brotons uh, felt about it in the beginning and why he stayed and it's so essential and all that being said I want to go straight to the basic question that I am like Diogenes, I'm going around collecting answers to this question in my work with a symphony as a writer. Um, why is music so important? You all are at a level where you can't live without it. It it's defines you, it's your life. 
and I want to go to the soul of it. From your, from your perspective, what is it about music that we simply can't live without? If we do live without it, we're the poorer for it, and we don't even know it. And this orchestra is providing that. It, it's like, you, you know what it is for you. What is it for all of us? How can music save us? Any way you want to answer that, I, I'm collecting answers. Uh, Pedro? I'd like to answer that first, please. Thank you. You said we don't even know it, and, and that is so true. But you know, I've, I've listened to a lot, a lot of interviews with um, cosmologists and you know, masters of physics and quantum physics, and all of these people know that we are at the height of our civilization and that we can explain a lot of things but there are some things like water. We don't really understand water that well, you know, how it behaves. And the other thing is these experts, uh, you know, incredible scientists, when you put to them this question about music, they're humbled. They do not understand music. I mean, after all, we had the greatest mind, Einstein, was a violinist, for a very bad violinist. <laughs> <laughs> If he was such a master of mathematics, why couldn't he control you know, music? Well, because he didn't have time to practice either. But music is, is something that uh, it, it transcends us, of course. It's a cliche. But let's say that we found a way to make contact with another civilization, because that's fashionable these days, right? We all talk about this. We all talk about you know, the, the, the Congress reports and the extraterrestrials and all of that stuff. If we were able to make contact with another civilization, can we be sure that they would have music too? But I would say yes, because it's a means of communication. You know, other animals uh, communicate this way. Whales, birds, we can call it music, but for them it may be communication. If 2,000 years ago Neanderthals, or however long ago it was, they had you know, pieces of bones that they drilled holes into. They had a need to communicate in some way. So in effect, I don't think it's possible to exist with these means to communicate, music, what we call music. But even the greatest minds don't really know how to approach it. They're humbled by it. And they know everything <laughs> except music. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear everybody on this. I can yeah. piggyback off that, sure. Um, I'd start by saying uh, I can't imagine my existence without music. I really can't. One of the first things that we learned in music school that I already knew from uh, uh, being a musician from a very young age is music is the universal language. And this speaks to what Pedro was just talking about, I mean communication. Uh, depending on the type of music that you're listening to, you can really cleanse yourself. You can forget about anything that's bothering you. You can enjoy it. You don't have to be in a position where you have to study it to understand it. Some of the, uh, uh, what they call serious composers are about all that, making sure that you have to uh, uh, intellectually understand where they're coming from. But if you're down, put on a blues album. If, if you're happy, uh, uh, listen to some rock, some up uplifting stuff. I've never had a problem uh, changing uh, a mood that I'm in because of my CD collection. I mean, I've got so many CDs, it was a priority of mine to make sure that I collected as much music as possible. And then now with uh, the internet and the streaming and this and that and the subscriptions that you can get, anyone has the opportunity to uh, uh, take advantage of that. So as a musician, I'll perform any type of music, right? As a uh, a connoisseur of music, I like all forms of music. There are some that I like more than others. Um, there's jazz, for instance. I've always considered jazz players to be some of the best players in the world because of some of the things they can come up with off the top of their head, in the moment. Uh, that's a, a, a quality that all of us share uh, as musicians, having to make adjustments in the moment depending on the circumstances that you're in on stage, particularly in a live performance. But jazz musicians, they just take it to a different level, in my opinion. Uh, so, 
I love music. I think that everyone that would question music should have to answer a simple question. Imagine your existence without it. As small as, or as minute as just sitting in a car listening to a commercial and hearing the jingle happen. Imagine your existence without music in your life. We were almost there. I mean, Zul talked about the, uh, the absence of the sound that he was so accustomed to, and we were so close. I mean, without these chronicles of uh, performances that are already on the books, uh, moving forward, yeah, it was, it was gonna be dead air. And fortunately, uh, and I speak for all the musicians in the orchestra, Igor, thank you. We are so fortunate to have him as uh, our executive director. I said before that I knew that the strings piece was going to survive. Uh, I didn't know how it was gonna move forward. Uh, the middle of the summer came and the phone rang and here's Igor, this is what we're gonna do this year. And I don't know how he did it. I'm just thankful that he was able to do it. And he even got some winds and some brass involved throughout the uh, concert season. And not too many orchestras in the country were able to pull that off. So I feel that we're in a great place. This is a strong organization with uh, uh, community support, uh, support of the board, support of the donors. And we were able to make it happen and continue. And it looks like now we're gonna be going ahead full steam. And so the live streams will always be an option. To look, I think uh, this is going to be something that I mentioned in relation to uh, the remote learning. How we move forward and how this is going to look is going to be different. But eventually we're going to get our audiences back. We're going to have full capacity and uh, we'll just keep moving forward. But if we don't have music, how are our souls going to be cleansed? That's the, that's the question that I would ask. And I think that music in terms of not only me, but uh, say my brother, for example, which is not a musician at all, but he loves music and listens to music and listens to all forms of music. That would be a great example. He tried his hat at oboe with the encouragement of my two parents. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, yes, 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 yes encouragement. I, that's what I would call it. I'm not sure he would call it that, but. Uh, Speaking, of, if I may just put in, sure, speaking sure. of aerosol, you said the word aerosol before. Uh -huh. I took part of an investigation by uh, the Princeton University mm -hmm. research, not investigation, research. Princeton University did a, um, some studies on musicians uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I went uh, and I had it, you know, I was tested by them. Uh, oh, really? Put my instrument in a chamber where there was gas and lasers and all kinds of stuff. and. Uh, they determined that, uh, yes, oboe players are the, the biggest danger. Mm. And it, it's not because of what comes out of the instrument. There's not actually not that much. It's the breathing. When you take a breath and then you expel, mm -hmm. that's when the, the, that's the, re the, that's the biggest problem with the wind players. It's the breathing, not necessarily the instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I, I can believe that. I knew of a study out of a, uh, Colorado. Was it Colorado Boulder? Igor, you might know that. You went to Colorado, didn't you? Yeah. There was a study or some research that happened there as well. Uh, what I would say to that is, uh, unfortunately, even if the results would have been in our favor, I think uh, uh, some administrations had already made up their mind that they were just going to uh, uh, go ahead and, and, and shut it down. And that will take us probably to a different topic when we move forward, uh, the importance of music education and the importance of getting the word out uh, to your boards of education, making sure that th this art form does not die. Uh, Igor, I'm gonna... Sure, well, I, I do join in, in, in the many, many important things that my colleague mentioned. I just add that, uh, you know, it's, it's, music is an essential and existential need for, for people, and it is for me. It's the need, it's the way, the most natural way we communicate with one another, uh, whether we are close to one another or whether we're far. Um, and the pandemic actually proved how important music is for, uh, for all of us. So, you know, it's, um, there are many studies done the, showing that, uh, you know, the effects of music as a healing instrument on, on, on people that are not well. There were, you know, there were research into music helping math scores and getting extracurricular activity to get into college. But I think the most important thing, it's the basic. It's, it's the most, it, it's, it, has, it exists on the right of its own, not as a tool for something else. So I think it's really an essential human element, human need. Mm -hmm. And so, 
I think the cliche is the music is the soundtrack to our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, that became very obvious to me when I was watching a couple of movies over the past 10 years, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. One was The Birds, and one, was, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And neither of them have soundtracks. There's no music in them, except for the radio playing and, and one flew over the cuckoo's nest in, in the, in the uh, hospital. And I, I noticed that there was something wrong because there was no music and there was no drive and no vibration. Now, where I'm going with the vibration is that, I, first of all, I think that music is, I don't think you'll find your answer. Uh, because music, I think, is the one art form that you really can't put your finger on it. You can't really describe it because it evokes feelings. Now, I ask this a lot. I ask this a lot to prisoners when I play in prisons. What's the opposite of love? I'm asking you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a lot of people say hate. And my response is that's another emotion. The opposite of love or hate or all of these emotions is indifference. When you don't feel, and when you don't feel, you don't vibrate, you're numb. And when you're numb, you're not alive. And so there are two aspects to this that I'll just really quickly tell you about. I have a carbon fiber cello that I play, and when I play, um, and I'm able to have young kids come close and put their hands on my cello while I'm playing it, the front of my cello. You can't imagine the change in them, feeling the music. The second story is when I play in the Niku units of infants uh, in the intensive care, uh, and they of course are newborns, and they're in their incubators, and I play softly with my cello sitting beside them, and their oxygen levels go up and their heart rates go down from hearing the sounds of the cello. How do you describe that? Why is that happening? It's magic. And so it, 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 there's something about music that affects us in ways that we can't describe, which which is what brings us back. And I think that's the vibrations of life. Wow. Any other questions from anyone uh, here with us today? Oh, wait, one back up here. Back up in the... (laughs) I heard there's only two kinds of music. Good music and bad music. Uh, Duke Ellington, <laughs> good music and the other kind. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Um, uh, first off, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to come out and speak. You guys, you guys, the stories you told were really interesting to listen to, um, especially of on the school level. Um, there were a lot of issues that were present in what you guys were talking about that I've seen, and I think it was very... Uh, just very interesting in, to, in general to listen to. Um, my question uh, for all of you is a little just kind of to get to know, like in your performances, uh, what do you guys think personally in your performances was either probably, it doesn't have to be the best one, but like the most memorable almost, like when you were out there performing, what about the performance just kind of stuck with you for the rest of your careers almost and that you could remember to today? Anybody have something jump to mind or a memorable yeah. performance? Yeah. I remember playing the St. Matthew's Passion with in Marlboro with Blanche Honegger conducting. And she was about ninety one years old and she conducted the whole thing by memory. Wow. Wow. Nice. And just the expression that came out, she knew the piece so well. All the recitatives uh, Oh, for those who are listening who do not know uh, St. Matthew's Passion, it's something that you must experience. Uh, and I think most musicians were weeping while performing this piece. And it was a funny sensation to weep while playing the oboe, I have to tell you that. But it was just so gripping, so powerful to play this incredible piece, already an incredible piece by Johann Sebastian Bach, but with Blanche conducting. It was incredible. I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to be in the orchestra supporting Andre Bocelli at the Hollywood Bowl three years ago. 
the m most memorable part of the performance was just the audience going crazy for opera. It was a capacity crowd and they were just screaming and hollering. And to me, that was so encouraging to see that art, music, opera is still important with people. And we're not talking about uh, 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 necessarily uh, uh, what I would call veteran concert goers. These were people my daughter's age, 20 year olds, 25 year olds that were just screaming and hollering and so thrilled to be part of that experience and just clamoring the entire time. And so uh, having that relationship with the contractor that enabled me to play is a priceless relationship that I have. But what was even more priceless is the experience of being on the stage and uh, seeing how nutty audiences can actually be for opera, for classical music. It was, it was amazing. I think one of my most memorable performing experience was when I played uh, Beethoven's first piano concerto with Washington Chamber Symphony at Kennedy Center. It was a children's concert. So we were sort of, uh, everybody was a little concerned because it, the, the hall of 2000 to 2500 was packed with kids and that, you know, that can be quite noisy. And uh, everybody was concerned, how would the concert go with uh, that many kids in the audience? Because, you know, they, they can just derail the entire agenda. And uh, as we walked on stage, and the, from the first note, the C major chord, there was complete silence in the hall. And they stayed, 2,000 kids stayed silent for the entire concerto, taking it all in. It was just an amazing experience to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Zool. Uh, you know, I said earlier on that uh, when I asked my uh, a mentor of mine whose favorite performers in history were, and he said his friends, um, you know, this, this pandemic has kind of made me think of, of the bucket list of life being kind of nonsense, the, the accolades, the, the, the bio, if you don't have your friends and family there, or, you know, how many people really remember you when you're no longer here. There's a, a, a positive end to this story. So um, my mom be, uh, was diagnosed with cancer about four or five years ago, very late stage. She was misdiagnosed. Um, we had already talked about prior to this, um, just because she heard a beautiful piece that I played one time that she said, you know, when I'm no longer here one day, um, would you play this in honor of me? And I said, I, I don't think I can do that, but I, I, I will thank you for letting me know. Um, and through 38 rounds of chemotherapy, uh, after the 38th round, um, we were, I was asked to play um, at this function, and my mom's a pianist. And uh, I asked her if she would play that piece with me. So we shared that moment together while she was alive of the piece that could possibly be to represent her when she wasn't here. And um, it was the most overwhelming personal experience I've ever felt on any aspect of my life. Um, and she beat cancer, she beat it, knock on wood, and uh, she's still alive. But the preciousness of life became so being present, giving your family hugs, telling people you love them while they're here. Um, is very, very important, and playing in Carnegie Hall or making a record or whatever whatever you can say, that doesn't come close to this, the magnificence of sharing something that is so meaningful, um, because my mom, it was, I'm family, whatever, the, the musician, the, the way you share music with your friends or colleagues, but with your own family, um, was a moment, a very impacting moment on me that... Um, as I said, I can't unfeel that, and that's that's something I never expected. And when I look out occasionally now, and I am playing for an audience, and I, I'm a cellist, so I get to kind of stare in the audience, and I see, during a slow movement of a concerto, someone reach over and hold the hand of their parent or their partner, um, and they smile, or they give each other a kiss, and they look at each other. It means the world to me, because it reminds me of the power of music and how it brings us together, uh, and it's so much bigger than us. So that's my that's my moment. Oh, wonderful. 
We are close to the end of the time we have. Uh, so should, do you want to do any more, Gore, or should we wrap it up? Okay. Are you, if you're all right with a little more, because I did, there's like one question um, here. Since we want to look forward, um, as I think as someone mentioned here, we are, we're, we're finding a way, the trajectory is out of the pandemic. There's still, you know, rough water ahead. But I would like to hear from each of you, uh, what's your outlook for, for organizations that, that present this kind of music, whether that's educational organizations or performance organizations? What do, you, what do you see looking forward? And I guess we'll start with Zul, if that's okay. Well, what I've loved about this, and this is what I, where I was going to go earlier with, uh, <coughs> um, you know, back in the, uh, when I was young, younger, um, you had to choose. You, you basically chose to be an educator or in a, a chamber group or a, a performer, or you know, uh, uh, you, you you somehow you were so locked into being something that was predetermined that someone else said that you had to choose between. Um, I think the what's so nice about now, I and mean, you were talking about with the audio file, the educational component and the administrative component, is that people were kind of forced to find themselves. And the advice that I have, and I'm giving myself this advice because, is that when you are yourself, you have no competition because you are, you're true and you're not trying to be something you're not. And I think that this exposed a lot of that, that we're all trying to kind of chase a carrot and do something what other, what other people are doing where um, I was so impressed with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, I was lucky enough to yeah, a guest here in, in May to see the beautiful area here that no one else has a gorgeous area like this. The The morale of the orchestra was so amazing. The conductor was so, um, your maestro was so so energetic and so happy. Of course, it was his first concert back. Um, is the, the the hope and the, 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 the way forward is to find yourself and embrace that and make that the path. Um, and uh, that's... And, and, and so in other words, you know, in, every audience is different. Um, you know, making it personal, what does this particular audience here in Vancouver need um, that some other audience doesn't know that they need? Um, and, uh, and it's a clean slate. It's a clean slate. So I'm inspired right now by all of these stories because um, I, my parents are all educators. Everybody in my family is an educator. My father was an administrator. Uh, like your wife, uh, I am an audiophile, uh, very big audiophile, uh, so I understand that completely too. Um, so the, all of these common threads, but um, um, this is this has forced us to to reevaluate why, how, and then just basically what what is next? What is our mission? That's what I was saying that I was thinking about in the silence. Is that why are we? What have I been doing? I've just been doing what I've always known. And that's to, to go forward, whether it's administratively in a school or an orchestra, you, we, we have to be flexible. Um, the people who are not flexible are what I call in life the one-trick ponies, where it's like an, um, an athlete. That's all they do. What if they get injured? Uh, what, you know, if, you are, if you're just a soloist and know the concerts are gone, what if that is gone? You, know, you, have, to, you have to think much larger than uh, and invest in your community. And I love to use that word. Um, you know, communities are a sound investment. And it starts from the bottom, which are the kids. Uh, and because that's the future of life, not just music, of everything. And music gives confidence. And this is what the competition's about tomorrow. Music gives opportunity. Music gives reality. Because in these competitions, which you're going to have tomorrow, the reality is that th there are going to be a lot of people who don't win. And they're going to ho hopefully get up on Monday morning and start again at even stronger. Because we never remember the good stuff mm. in life. We always remember the being knocked down. But the, the, and that's what I'm hoping people learn from all of this, is that we were knocked down as a society. 
uh, and we don't want it to happen again, but it can happen again. And when it happens again, or it's going to happen different, how are we going to do it better? Mm-hmm. Thank you. We'd like okay. to jo- join Zul actually in, in saying that probably the most important quality we discovered in ourselves as a society of people, a society of musicians, is that we have to adapt. And I believe that uh, are the good organizations that are in tune with their mission, with their audiences, whether it's a performing arts organization, if it's an orchestra or a school, uh, those that are in tune with, uh, with their mission and their constituents will survive and will go on and do wonderful things. And, uh, you know, we cannot, we cannot do one thing anymore. You know, we have to be able to pivot and do many things. And there are many, many, many ways that we can connect with people, whether we are as performer or administrators, and to bring music to, um, to everybody who wants, wants to have it. But I believe that adapting and reevaluating and connecting are going to be <coughs> the most important things going forward. I mentioned earlier that having the opportunity to participate in music programs uh, develops lifelong skills. I can piggyback on what Zul said. I mean, perseverance, resiliency. This is what our young artists tomorrow are going to have to experience if they do not win. Even if they do win, there's always going to be another challenge put before them. So uh, the ability to persevere, the ability to be uh, resilient, these are characteristics or attributes that a young person learns because they're exposed to the arts. You have collaboration, you have problem solving, uh, working with others, some of which you don't necessarily see eye to eye with. These are all attributes that young musicians learn before anyone else does that doesn't have the opportunity or is unwilling to participate in these programs. So it is, Uh, uh, imperative that these programs continue. I believe they will. I believe that I have a real positive outlook on uh, the arts organizations moving forward, particularly the ones that can adapt. And uh, those in leadership with those organizations uh, are usually products of public school or private school music programs and have that ability as a life skill to be able to adapt, change in the moment if need be. These are important qualities that employers look for. You can always be a 4.0 student, you can always get the job, but your performance on the job, your ability to uh, 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 convey these attributes is going to be a testament to whether or not you keep the job. And so as an educator and a musician, I try to mentor kids into being employable. And that's really the most important thing for me as a, a, an educator is showing them opportunity on the horizon and making sure that they're going to be ready for the opportunity once it's presented to them. Uh, music and the arts has always been what we refer to as low-hanging fruit when the budget cuts come around. It's imperative that our parents, our grandparents, they uh, uh, write letters, you know, uh, Uh, speak out at board meetings in support of these programs because these are, in a lot of ways, why kids get up and go to school, right? They they like that collaboration. They like knowing that their friends are in these classes. I mentioned before that the gaps in learning are real and are going to be addressed. What we call the core four, math, English language arts, uh, science, social studies, those are going to be very, very important moving forward, but we can't throw away uh, uh, the arts. We can't throw away any of the other electives that give these kids a creative outlet that they can shine, that they can feel successful, and they can uh, take those successes from those classes into their academic classes. It is so important because right now, particularly coming off the pandemic, a lot of administrations are just thinking about the core four. And I understand why, but they need to understand why, and they need to hear from uh, individuals other than the music teachers or the other elective teachers. They need to hear from individuals that uh, would be, well, taken a little bit more seriously, and that's the community. Those are the parents, those are the grandparents, those are the community partners. So I implore you, uh, if you're any of those, to uh, let your administrations at your school districts know the importance of these programs. 
what can I say after my three great colleagues? That's great. All I can say is we're going to be okay. We have many more programs today that they had when I was a kid. And uh, there is a facility for everyone to learn music, to play an instrument. And the important thing is that for each generation, it's the previous generation that has trouble adapting to the music of the new generation. The music has no trouble adapting. It's the previous generations. And you have to understand that what the new generation has now with their popular music that we all oppose to, that's what they have. That's their music because they inherited what we gave them. You know, we already had John Cage. We already had Mozart. We already went back. So they want to do their own thing. And uh, it's important that we just don't under understand the direction, but also that they know and we know that symphonic music will always exist as long as we exist. Some people are naysayers. The others say, no, we, we cannot perform music on these museum pieces of old dead composers. Well, yes, but maybe in 100 years, we will be uh, playing the music of you know, Bad Bunny or Lady Gaga in an orchestra. You know, it's just a matter of fact that uh, it's important to have this richness of colors in music making. And so it doesn't matter what we play today or what we play into the future. It's the need, the need that we have for this means of communication. Whales have it, birds have it, but well, we have them too. <laughs> All right. I believe Ashley has some final remarks. So while she finds her way up here, I'm going to thank, thank my panelists so much. This was, this was really great uh, and really inspiring. So Zul, Igal, Stephen, and Pedro, thank you. Thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure having you all with us. Have a wonderful evening.